Hello and welcome back to Down the Scope. In the last video we covered the basic units of earthworm anatomy that can be seen on a transverse section. Now I want to move on to talk about what we can see on the longitudinal section of an earthworm's head. Within this section we can see components of four major body systems. The gastrointestinal system, the nervous system, the reproductive system and the circulatory system. On the right we can see the earthworm's prostomium and mouth. As in the transverse section, there's specific terminology for orientating ourselves. So towards the right would be cranial or towards the head, whilst the left side of the slide would be caudal moving towards the tail. If we follow the mouth caudally, we can find the pharynx and then the esophagus surrounded by the calciferous gland. We can spot elements of the nervous system such as the cerebral ganglion, the pseudo-hearts of the circulatory system and the testes and seminal vesicles of the reproductive system. So let's take a more detailed look at each of these systems individually. First off, we can start with the gastrointestinal tract. The worm's mouth opens on the first section, called the peristomium. Earthworms have a bit of tissue overhanging the mouth, called the prostomium. This small protrusion and its anatomical relation to the peristomium can be a useful aid in speciating worms. The peristomium has a high concentration of sensory organs, including chemoreceptors, that sense different chemical signals, mechanoreceptors that sense touch, and light receptors, which is about as far as earthworms have got in terms of developing eyes. It's very hard to spot these sensory organs within a section, but we can have a little go now. So what we can see here at the opening of the peristomium is what looks like a tiny projection of the epithelium with little tufts on it, and beneath it a kind of ball of cells that look like the rings of an onion. This looks very much like an epidermal sense organ, and if we have a look at a schematic picture, then you can probably see the similarities. This is just one example of one of the epidermal sense organs that an earthworm has to be able to work out what's going on in the environment around it. Moving caudally, we can see the earthworm's mouth occupying the first three segments, which it uses to prehend food. The epithelium is very similar to that of the skin. But if we look closely, we can appreciate that there are fewer goblet cells and no albumin cells within the mouth. As we move caudally, the nature of the epithelium begins to change. Suddenly the cells have cilia on their surface. This means that we've reached the pharynx. Dorsal to the pharyngeal epithelium, there's a large mass of red tissue. You might be forgiven for thinking this is the worm's brain. But if we look closer, it doesn't look like neural tissue. There are no nerve cells at all. Instead, this part is characterised by blood vessels and muscle. The earthworm uses this mass of muscle as a suction pump to draw food from the mouth further into the digestive tract. Finally, the last structure we can see on this section is the esophagus. This will eventually lead to the earthworm's crop and gizzard, which are not on this section. However, we can appreciate another rather unique organ of earthworms. This outpouching of the esophagus with numerous folds of tissue is the calciferous gland. This gland secretes calcium carbonate particles coated in mucus. Each of the folds you can see is composed of two layers of secretory epithelium surrounding a central blood vessel. The calciferous gland's function is to secrete excess calcium from the earthworm's blood. It's excreted in the form of calcium carbonate, which forms calcite crystals in the gut and cannot be reabsorbed on this second passage of the gastrointestinal tract. Above the esophagus, we can appreciate some remnants of the worm's pseudo hearts. They're not very clear on this section, but they're worth mentioning. Unlike us, earthworms don't have a single muscular heart that pumps their blood in a single direction. Instead, the dorsal vessel, which we could see on the transverse section, is contractile 
and pulses at a rate of about 11 pulses per minute. This keeps the blood moving along the vessel and also around the rest of the circulatory system. The dorsal vessel is attached to the ventral vessel in all body segments by paired commissural vessels which run in the peripheral coelom and body wall. In five segments, these commissural vessels are enlarged and contractile. These are the pseudo-hearts, which also contain valves to maintain unidirectional flow. The cells that make up these contractile blood vessels don't look very specialised, and there's no specialised conductive tissue as there is in more developed hearts. Close to the calciferous gland, we can find two components of the worm's male reproductive tract, the seminal vesicles and the sperm reservoir. In this section, I couldn't find any testes. Unlike in mammals, the testes don't complete maturation of spermatozoa. Within the testes, structures called morula form. These are groups of cells which have undergone meiosis, or two rounds of cell division, which results in four sister cells with half a set of chromosomes each. These cells share a common central cytoplasm called the cytophore. Once formed, the morally of spermatocytes travel to the seminal vesicles, where they begin to mature to spermatids with flagelli and all the morphological features you would expect a mature sperm cell to have. All of the cells that form a morula are at the same stage of development. Once the sperm are mature, the morula breaks up and the sperm travel to the sperm reservoir where they wait to be released. If we go back to the seminal vesicles, we can find another common feature, another parasite. But rather than being a nematode like the rhabditis of the nephridium, this is a protozoan called monocystis. Protozoa often have very complex life cycles with many life stages. This particular one is no exception. Monocystis survives in spores in the environment. When it's eaten by an earthworm, eight sporozoites hatch out and make their way to the testes. Each one enters a morula and becomes a trophozoite, where it consumes the cytoplasm, which is rich in proteins and nucleic acids. The parasite will use these for division later. The trophozoite grows as the sperm cells disintegrate, leaving their flagella attached to the parasite's surface. These mature trophozoites pair up and form a mating pair called a syzygy, which is surrounded by a polysaccharide capsule called a gametocyst. The nucleus of each trophozoite begins to divide, creating two multinucleated gametocytes with gametes inside. The membranes of each gam gametocyte disintegrates to allow the gametes from each gametocyte to fuse as they would during sexual reproduction. The fusion of two gametes forms a zygote, which will eventually become a spore with eight sporozoites inside, ready to be released into the soil and infect another worm. What we can see in this section are numerous gametocysts, each filled with tens of visible spores containing sporozoites. All of this parasitic activity doesn't seem to affect the earthworm's reproductive fitness or health, which is quite surprising given how many parasites there seem to be here. Finally, let's have a look at the nervous system. We can see two components here, the ventral nerve cord and the cerebral ganglion. The ventral nerve cord runs along all the segments of the worm, but we can only see a small section of it here. At the cranial end of the earthworm, it begins to curve up, as we can see in this diagram. As the nerve cord loops upwards, it splits into two around the pharynx and joins again to form the cerebral ganglion. The nervous tissue we can see just in front of the pharynx in this section is part of the cerebral ganglion. Nerves arising from the cerebral ganglion supply the prostomium, while the nerve cord provides segmental nerves to each body segment. If we zoom in on the cerebral ganglion, we can see some of the neurons. There are no motor neurons here. Instead, there is a, an, an external layer of small spindle-shaped ganglion cells with a few larger cells between them. 
The material between the nerve cells is called the neuropil. It's made up of axons and the projections from the nerve cell bodies which connect together. Here in the cerebral ganglion, it is very dense. Compare this to the structure of the nerve cord. Here we have motor neurons, which have very large cell bodies with the classic dendrites, which give the appearance of what everyone thinks a neuron should look like. If we switch back to the transverse section quickly, we can appreciate more of the ventral nerve cord structure. The nerve cord is surrounded by a layer of fibrous tissue called the epineurium. At the top of the nerve cord, there are three giant nerve fibres, one in the middle, called the median fibre, and two at the end, the lateral fibres. These giant nerve fibres run the entire length of the earthworm and connect to a single cell body in each segment, as well as giving off other dendritic branches. The fibres are large to speed up conduction of nerve signals. The neurons in the nerve cord are confined to the ventral and lateral portions. Each neuron will have a single axon which carries its impulses, but will also receive input from one or two other neurons via dendrites, which are smaller branching projections. So that about sums up all of the histological structures that we can see on the classical earthworm sections. And if you like the content that I'm starting to create, feel free to subscribe to the channel as well. The next video will go back to entomology and we'll be looking at a sheep ked or Melophagus ovinus, one of the few insects that incubates its larva within its own body.